Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Literacy View. We have part two today of the curriculum craze, and we are sticking with our article, Where is the Evidence? So we have Dr. Leslie Laud with us tonight and Jen Binnis. And uh, let me read a little bit about each one. So Dr. Leslie Laud is the founder of Think SRSD, that is Self-Regulated Strategy Development for Reading and Writing. She is a writer, researcher, and leader in the science of writing instruction. She also co-authored the book, um, Releasing Writers, Evidence-Based Strategies for Developing Self-Regulated Writers. And uh, her article is going to be the focus of tonight. We also invited Jennifer Binnis with us. And uh, Jennifer is president of School Marm Advisors. She is a former middle school special education teacher and professional development provider. She has facilitated large and small scale audit and design projects with and for schools, districts, and states. She is a freelance editor for education and academic authors, researcher, and fact checker, which got our attention. And I think, Jen, you just came out with a newsletter called, Dis did. is that it? Oh, no, Dissertate, excuse Dissertate. me. Dissertate. Very cool. All right, we're going to put that link in the show notes Thank you. as well. So, um, all right, well, welcome to the Literacy View. And we're going to get started. So I'm going to open it up with Leslie, since this is her article. And um, it was really um, quite an interesting one. You said so many um, just uh, amazing things in such a really tight article. So I hope we get a chance to address um, many of those items. So first thing I want to ask you about, Leslie, is... This idea of unproven solutions in large, expensive boxes. Um, those are your words that you um, had said pretty much at the beginning of the article. What's going on if it's unproven? And can you tell us um, how you know this is unproven? Because if you look on social media, uh, the thought is that all of these programs are proven that there is evidence behind them. And yet in your article, you specifically said unproven solutions in large expensive boxes. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. I have a million thoughts going through my head. Um, the box itself has not been put through a randomized control trial in most cases. There are a few that have. And like you, I've been around for a long time. I was there for Reading First. I was there when Common Core arrived. And way back at Reading First, I remember watching to see would we get the data on which of these boxes was actually working. Because if you remember, we had them before. We had them back then. And we were starting to get a couple of names of which ones looked more promising. And that would have been evidence from school outcomes. And so I'm open to that. I'm open to seeing our schools using these boxes and are they seeing ELA proficiency gains or K2? Are they seeing Dibble, Star, Map, whatever data is being used K2? Are they seeing those gains? Or have they been through a randomized control trial? Off the top of my head, I know Bookworms has, I know that Open Court has. So if it's been through something like that, then you can call it proven. According to the national shared definition from ESSA of the different tiers of evidence that can support a program. Now that said, that's for the that's for a whole program. There are pieces and components in these boxes that are very promising and that 
mirror match what we have found in large scale studies to be effective for the different components and pieces, but are they all pulled together perfectly? Are they all weighted? Are they all, are teachers being given guidance on which parts are more effective than others? That we don't know. So I'm worried when I see people saying that these are evidence-based, the vast majority are not. So Jen, um, you know, Judy and I have seen your tweets or X's. I don't know what you call them now. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, I, I found um, your posts very interesting. I want to ask you about these platforms that, um, you know, such as Ed Reports and others like it. What do you think of that as a way for people to check on whether or not they're in the green or if they truly do what they say they're supposed to do. Any thoughts on that? Well, I'm coming at it from this conversation from a slightly different perspective. Um, I do not know what sounds the letter E makes. I do not know the difference between a morpheme and a, and a phoneme. And I, and I almost deliberately remain ignorant of that because for me, what I'm interested in, what I'm curious about isn't so much the act of teaching reading, I, I'll defer to the experts on that, it's how we talk to teachers about the teaching of reading. So what I'm interested in is all the stuff around, uh, around teachers and the act of teaching. And so when we talk about um, reports like ed reports, when we talk about whether or not things are tried and trusted and, and whether or not we can have confidence in something, I'm hoping that one of the major lessons we take away from reading first was the issue of conflict of interest. And the conflicts of interest issue was so profound during Reading First, there was a Senate hearing about it. The Senate actually published a report about literary experts who were recommending a program to a school in one conversation and working with a publisher 10 minutes later. And in giving publishers feedback on what schools wanted and steering schools towards particular publishers. And acknowledging that is not an indictment or a, in, is saying anything about anyone in the conversation today. It's saying, this has happened before, let's not do it again. Mm -hmm. And all we know for sure, as of today, um, I didn't get a chance to check everybody today, but as of, as of yesterday, the only recommending group organization that's out there that has a conflict of interest statement, that has a clear um, articulated guide about how publishers should talk about them, who has statements of confidentiality, statements of trust, et cetera, et cetera, is Ed Reports. And so the only, at this time, at this particular moment in time, the only recommendations that can be trusted are those that come from Ed Reports. The challenge is that a lot of people now don't necessarily trust Ed Reports. And we there's a conversation and struggle to have around that, but I think it's worth kind of raising those every time we can, that if we have friends that are pushing for programs, be candid and open about conflict of interest, about confidentiality, how are you using teacher testimonials, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, interesting. Well, I think we will talk a bit about conflict of interest. That is um, a hot topic, and I think it is very relevant to our conversation tonight. Judala, so yeah, <laughs> so you're having some problems over there with your internet. So I just want to um, let everybody know that if Judy goes in and out a bit, we're going to kind of help her along. But I hope Judy will be able to respond. Um, so Judy, you're listening to what Leslie said about evidence based, and that really as a package. Um, we're not really seeing the evidence, although there are parts of programs that um, clearly have evidence to it, but, you know, how do teachers know? And um, they're left to have to figure this all out. And then, you know, Jen is talking about how some programs could be pushed and steered um, in the direction, and that could be a conflict of interest. Any thoughts that you want to add right now and comments to what either Jen or Leslie said? So thank you both 
for being here today. We were really excited. I'm really excited to have a fact checker here because my my own son, that's his side gig. He goes to Ithaca College and he does some fact checking now too as a freshman. So I think that's really exciting. So from a teacher's perspective, because I'm still in the field, I still work with kids and I coach, this is extremely concerning. It's extremely kind of annoying and I think, you know, initially so many teachers, we were so excited that, you know, we're moving towards structured literacy and we're going to get these programs with all these bells and whistles. But now that, you know, implementation started, I don't know how much science there is on, you know, implementation. And then you'll ask online on Twitter, like I woke up this morning and I saw there was a Twitter storm and I couldn't be online most of the day because I was at work. But you'll see somebody post a report or some piece of evidence. And, and to be honest, I'm very active in the field. I feel confident when I'm looking at student data and outcomes and Acadians and um, screeners and all of that stuff. But I'm not an expert at reading reports. And it makes me really uncomfortable that I see so many publishers just like they did in balanced literacy. It's the same thing, right? I bought like 50 F and P boxes for my school at some point, And I got a free grant and I was all excited. And that box was gold. And the continuum <laughs> from F and P was like, like, oh my God, it was almost like the Bible of, you know, for teachers. And this is what we swore by. And I feel like we're going in the same exact direction of, you know, thinking that there's these magic boxes that are going to have all these solutions and that everything's going to be perfect. When in fact, you know, a lot of people are posting stuff about oh this sucks or hmh sucks but you're not telling me what's so great about your program and you're not showing me the results and the evidence about student now when you're making those statements it's very easy to say something else sucks without having the research and data and evidence to show me why what you're doing or your program is so wonderful you know That's i want to see more point. data and i don't want to just see data I don't want to just see data. I want to see data with similar demographics, with similar kids in similar poverty levels, possibly. You know, looking at data, the apples to apples. looking at outcomes is a serious apples to apples, Faith. Thank yes. you. I'm going to cheers. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I don't uh, trust at, anybody. I don't trust anybody right at now. At this point, I don't either. Um, I think you make a very good point that, um, you know, we need to see results. And I think that's exactly what Leslie was talking about, that we need to see these model schools and evidence. So Leslie, tell us a little bit about your vision from your article that you're not seeing now, but you think that that's the direction we should be going in. Just, um, again, this is could be opinion, but, um, you know, Give us some background about what you were talking about when you said we need some model schools. Tell us what you mean by that. It's the oldest sales trick in the world to say buy now and you'll get a discount. Buy now and create urgency. And we're all hearing that and seeing that. And I don't know what the rush is. I think we need to be slow and deliberate and think first. And um, in the article, in the end, I linked to the idea Bright's Thoughts, which was, um, I believe it was Vietnam during Feed the World. And we had gone in with all these um, Western notions of how we were going to fix hunger in these countries and superimposing them and not making any headway. And then some really sharp guy went in and said, well, wait, what if we flip it and actually imagine that there are funds of knowledge and that these people know what they're doing? And what if we look for the babies who are the strongest and the healthiest and then study how did they get that way? And they went in with that kind of open-minded, respectful view and they found the kids and then they figured out that they were mixing in tiny little crabs to the rice and their babies were fatter and healthier and stronger. And then they began having them teach that to other moms. And why not find the schools that are flourishing, uncover the brilliance of what they're doing in those schools, and then take those school people and have them meet with other school people, set up Zoom, set up meetings, 
and spread what is working and have people do it who are familiar with the evidence base so that we can speed up the process and find the gems more quickly and easily that align with what works. So I think we should go slow. I think we should create a huge chart. This wouldn't be hard to do. I know that my state tracks what curriculum each town is using. Then just go into the state data, pull down, see how they did last year, see how they did the year before, and see who's making the greatest gains and go figure out what's happening there. Well, I think there is this sense of urgency that people are feeling that for so long that we have low performing kids um, not able to read and there is this rush to do something, but that something could be a very expensive mistake. I mean, and um, costly in many ways. Um, you know, and and it could be putting kids through another experiment, right? That's that's part of it. Um, Jen, so um, in Leslie's article, she had said, um, let me find it, that uh, the goal is to teach the reader, not the content. It's cart before horse to propose without evidence that if we build knowledge, everything else will fall into place. This defies decades of settled research that explicit instruction and strategies and underlying language development are powerful levers that moves ELA proficiency scores forward. Now, my question to you, since, you know, you do kind of look into things like this, is um, what do you think about putting the cart before the horse? I think one of the, what I focus in on and kind of where uh, what I'm interested in is the unintended consequences of privileging test scores. Um, one of the things that we know right now, we're kind of working through it and kind of coming to terms with the fact that one of the consequences of No Child Left Behind may be that science and social studies are pushed to the back. When schools had failing test scores, when they saw their names on the bottom of a list, they said, we've got to raise those test scores. Let's jettison science and social studies. And so when we talk about evidence, from my perspective, just talking about the rhetoric, just thinking about the messaging teachers are hearing, I think we really, really need to be careful about an over-reliance on test scores and what it is we're communicating by saying our measure of success is improved proficiency on a state test. And so if the, one of the fears is replicating the mistakes of reading first around uh, conflict of interest, there's also the fear of replicating the mistakes around chasing test scores. And I, I appreciate the value of honoring schools that are doing it well and celebrating schools that are that have success. I just think we need to be very, very careful about how we communicate those measures of success to the public, that we don't repeat the message, it's just about the test scores, it's just the test scores. Because it takes an incredible amount of, lot of faith for school leaders to dial, dial back up science and social studies and trust that their scores aren't going to drop. It's gonna take a lot of trust for them to do that. So kind of my thinking with the cart and the horse is, let's be careful about the test scores. Mm -hmm. So how, but then how, getting back to Leslie's point about a model school, how do we pick out a model school? I mean, I, you know, I think yeah. there needs to be um, some parameters, wouldn't you yeah. say? So one of the things that we know is that we are willing to change our practice and our minds if a message comes from someone we trust. When people we do not trust tell us to do something, we human beings are more likely to fight against that, to push back, to reject the message. And we can use the cliche, you know, don't shoot the messenger, but we still feel that. So I think what we really need to do is get a lot, lot smaller. So the, the database that Leslie mentioned, that's not something that exists here in New York State. Uh, we have the highest, probably the highest degree of local control in the country. And the way it works though, is that districts are coming together on their own. And a lot of the change that's happening is it hitting the radar. They're not, they're not, you know, doing tours. They're not, they're, they're not getting stories written about them, but the change is happening. 
So when we talk about model schools, I think we really need to kind of dial it down smaller and think local communities of change. So instead of saying, you know, drawing a national attention to a particular school, try to draw local reporters' attention to a local school in lowering the volume around what makes this school model. Because this, the people around that school are going to understand the jargon and the vernacular and the local, you know, technicalities that can be applied in their locality. But what works in Mississippi, it, well, in one extent can work in New York State, but there's many things that can't transfer. And it's frustrating, I, I suspect, for New York State teachers to be told, look to this Mississippi school. Well, that Mississippi school, similar demographics, but a very different political climate, very different funding systems, very different boxes. That's very so interesting. That actually, Judy, that kind of goes along a little bit with what you were saying, that you know, you'd like to see... <laughs> Um, a similar school that you're in. Yeah, and I think that, you know, if we are looking at assessments, we have to remember with uh, a lot of these state tests, kids opt in, kids opt out, not everybody's taking it. So there could be so much, you know, unfairness with that. Also, you know, who knows what happens? You know, there's no, you know, proctors coming from the outside to watch these state tests. I really think that that should be something that we think about for fairness, right? Not, you know, make sure that everybody's, you know, doing the right thing. I think it's a, it's, it's a really important thing. And I think that if we only use test scores, that can be problematic. I think a very important piece of it is looking at the universal screeners that have been implemented. They tell a really, really, really uh, big picture and take a pulse of what's going on in terms of data. And the truth of the matter is, I know that you know change is going to take time. And many schools right now may be looking at data and thinking what's going on, are we not doing enough? Are we doing too little, are we doing too much? And that's really good if you're having those type of questions because those are the kind of questions that are going to help us take programs and design a better curriculum for our schools. These assessments are working, these are not working. We spend too much time doing this and it's not having an impact. So, you know, I, I, I encourage all people in the field right now, you know, sometimes I feel discouraged. I had to do professional development today. And um, sometimes you have to speak about the sad reality that you're not where you want to be. Yeah. But don't give up, change takes time. Um, realize that these programs are definitely far from perfect. I don't care if it's expeditionary learning, HMH, wit and wisdom, core knowledge. There's no such a thing as a perfect program. And, um, you know, stay wise. But I think the question that a lot of people have is, how did we make the decisions of what's being selected and how are certain programs getting on these quote unquote approved lists? I know that, you know, um, I've heard that core knowledge has so much, you know, evidence behind it, and it's not on the New York City approved list. So I really want to know more about that and how that all happened. And um, I want to know Leslie's feeling and also Jen's feeling on what do you guys think of these lists that are now on state mandates? Yeah, so... Leslie, would you like to speak to that for a moment? I mean, we've done it before and it did not work. It did not work to have these boxes appearing in the schools. Maybe they helped make some shifts. I will admit that. But now um, the divide that I see is within the SOR world. I think within SOR, we're not looking at f and and we're not looking at Calkins. We're looking at an array of SOR supposedly aligned programs. And now the battle is which one to adopt and to adopt in a hurry. And I'm really worried about um, the millions and millions of dollars that are behind this that nobody's talking about. These companies have millions that they can pour into marketers. And then these marketers are professionals who know how to apply the pressure and manipulate unsuspecting teachers who are not trained in rhetoric and are not trained in how to identify marketing when it's happening and are falling for classic marketing sales techniques. 
And then schools are spending millions of dollars. And this is not trivial. My state, Massachusetts, got $1.8 billion in 2020 during the pandemic. Where is it? What happened to our schools? Why are our scores not up? But I do know that millions and millions were spent on curricula. Who negotiated that? Who brought those people in? Why did they spend it on that rather than investing in coaching or academies to bring up the knowledge base of teachers? Where did all of that go? And Jennifer talks about um, conflicts of interest. And she said that Ed Reports is the only one out there with a conflict of interest statement. I would love to see organizations like the Reading League, who I do trust, um, put out a conflict of interest statement, the new um, Curriculum and Insight Project. It's not a nonprofit, so there won't be a 990. With the Reading League, we can look at the 990 and we can see who the donors are. And I actually looked and looked at the people and looked them up. And I'm not seeing anything that's raising red flags, but Curriculum Insight Project is a private company. We don't know who the donors are. They could be the curriculum companies that are being recommended. And then that weakens my trust in what they're recommending and why. And well, then I want to get what Jen has to say about that since she's the fact checker. <laughs> <laughs> and I was explaining to, to Faith when we were chatting before. And I do want to clarify um, that fact checking always happens before something is published. So uh, fact checking is something, yeah, that, that the author gets to choose whether or not to keep or change information. So when people are fact checking something that's out in the world, it's not really fact checking, it's critiquing. We may colloquially call it fact checking, but by, the fact checking is confidential between me and my clients. Um, but it, kind of to build on what Leslie's saying, I think one of the things we have to be careful of is the time scale. Um, everything right now is just moving so, so, so quickly. And New York State has been dragging its feet and I don't mind one bit. And I know there are advocates who are frustrated that New York State hasn't done more, but the advantage of that of New York State not putting out a list of not passing laws is districts have been able to make change at the speed, not necessarily that's comfortable, but at the speed their community can go at. And if they if New York State put out a list now, it would waste millions of dollars in, in profession in hours and all the time that people have spent in professional development if that PD provider doesn't make it onto a state sanctioned list. So I think we just kind of have to be careful. And if I were, I tell you, if I worked in the marketing department of a publisher, I would become an expert in dyslexia. I would find out what lawmakers are have a say in those lists. And you better believe I would be talking about how good my program is about dyslexia and making sure those lawmakers knew, oh, you can count on us. We got you covered. And well, I sure think that the the boxes are filled with so many different things. I, I think that it targets all different types of learners, uh, English language learners, as well as kids um, who might be lagging behind uh, in their reading. And that's the whole point. It's filled with so many different things that you can't possibly do it all. So it's up to the teacher to pick and choose and it's overwhelming for many of the teachers to get. Or their administration might say, you're getting through the whole program. You're doing every lesson with fidelity. And you, even if your data is It's impossible, it's right? It's impossible to do that with fidelity, right? I mean, Judy, um, we talk about the F-bomb all the time. This, you know, the fidelity word. How in the world can you do a program with fidelity if there's so much in the box? You, you know, you can't it's very, very hard. I think it's easier for teachers to do things with fidelity when it comes to something like um, a phonics program. But when it comes to the knowledge building portion, especially, you know, when kids are just learning how to read, it's not that easy. And my concern, you know, everybody's using this word knowledge building every day on the Internet. It's like the big thing. Knowledge matters. Knowledge this knowledge that. And we're, I, I'm sure all four of us are in agreement that knowledge is very important. But my concern is um, when kids are just learning how to read, whether they're in K or one or two, that's a very um, serious process. It just doesn't happen through the power of osmosis. It is a very physical thing. It is a very, it's a thing that takes a lot of time and energy and attention. How do you point? How do you decode a word? How do you slide through a word? And, you know, the knowledge building is important, but 
you know, sometimes I'll see lessons about um, author's point of view in the third person. And, you know, some of these little bodies are like six years old. And in my perspective, and it's only an opinion, there's more important priorities at that moment in time. Because, you know, as time goes on, kids, of course, they need to understand, but they could only understand well when they could lift those words off the page. And if we don't make sure that that's happening and we're saying, oh, yeah, the data is great, but I want to see can kids read the words on the page? If they can't in third grade read, we have a big problem. And unfortunately, from what I'm seeing, there's a lot of kids, even in fifth grade, all over the place, even in the suburbs, that cannot read. I work with kids in the suburbs, seventh grade, struggling with reading. And nobody's really talking about that. Everybody's throwing this knowledge word. And yes, we know it's important. And, you know, I was a classroom teacher. We did knowledge building. That was something that was always there. And we had social studies and we had science. But um, I'm worried. I'm really worried. And I think that, you know, salespeople are taking over. Um, listen, Emily Hanford, journalist, that was great that she brought attention to a problem. But let's start listening to what's happening into those classrooms from our teachers, too. Teachers' voices have been diminished, and it's time to talk to them about what are they doing, what's working, what's not working, and show us some evidence. We want real evidence that we're doing the right thing in the field. So... Leslie, um, I'm sure you've heard that um, Natalie Wexler talks about um, giving these programs time, you know, because when we talk about the research, we don't have outcomes right now. I think I saw she tweeted that today, right? Yes. And so it's expected that over time it will show, but that's really a prediction. And um you know, people are banking on that happening and great if it happens, but what if it doesn't? But what if it doesn't? So could yeah. you talk a little bit, Leslie, about that piece? Because I find that really concerning, you know, that we are, um, you know, hoping that because we would say, oh, well, knowledge is cumulative and it is. Obviously, it is cumulative, but that still doesn't mean that the program, which they call, of course, the curriculum, is going to prove to be one that produces, as Judy said, gains in children. Like results. And this, is the, this is the actual quote that I saw online today. It took years for the effect of a knowledge building curriculum to show up on tests like standardized reading tests. If those curricula don't yield quick results, it must might just take more time. Yeah, could you speak to that, Liz? Is she referring to the Dr. James Kim article? I think so. Okay, I was concerned that that would happen. Okay, so, and then I want to go back to the 50 schools that I worked with last year and the different curricula that they were all using. Um, that study was not about her vision of knowledge building. I just re-listened to her speaking with Emily Freetag today and her, her vision was to fill the kids with bits of knowledge and groups of knowledge and fill in all the gaps in their knowledge. His study was something totally different. It was about building transferable schema. So how animals survive in first grade, how dinosaurs went extinct in second grade, so that you could take a larger mental model and transfer it up to grades. It was not about, let's build information about the states. That was an example she gave. How can you understand the USA if you don't know what a state is? It wasn't about incremental brick by brick building knowledge. It was something totally different. It was about building schemas. So I, I wondered if she would kind of co-op that and here she's gone and co-op that. So that's number one. Then number two, no, it doesn't take years and years. Our research, which Nate Hanford is going, Nate Joseph is going to publish soon, um, showed that we could get 20% gains in a year. Show, it, we have seen this every single year. In Pawtucket, Rhode Island, we had a 25% gain in one year. We see dramatic upticks when schools take on evidence-based practices. And in the 50 schools that I worked with last year, 
there was really no correlation between what program you were using and um, the ELA gains. And so we had schools using, they were embarrassed to tell us this dinosaur reading street from 2013, and they got really strong gains. ReadyGen, which has been discontinued, got took um, PS200 in Brooklyn from 33% proficient to over 60. ReadyGen. So I don't know the, how I felt the, about ready Gen Leslie. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about ready Gen, but but when you bring in powerful evidence based practices and integrate these, and, and that makes sense what they can do. That so that makes sense. No correlation. Leslie, do you know that makes sense? And I'm going to say something controversial. I think I said it on the uh, on another evening. I worked in a school, and they were a different school in the past as a coach, and they still had you know Lucy. But we made some modifications to it, like not looking at pictures, like decoding words and, you know, sliding through a point of difficulty. And even with that, yes, it wasn't the best program, right? It was flawed and it wasn't structured enough. But like the point is that whatever you have, you can make gains. And I think one of the most important things that I've come away from, from Faith, from learning from Maureen Ruby and all our other guests, is pedagogy is very important pedagogy. and there's not enough discussion about pedagogy so i think pedagogy should you know be the, the problem buzzword. the problem is that it never will be a buzzword do you know why because there's no money in it yeah bingo Marketing right there. companies <laughs> right they're here <laughs> They're up in multi, multi millions. We are not playing around. Like I've been really worried about doing this podcast because is somebody going to come after me? There are millions and tens, maybe hundreds of millions on the table. And there are marketers out there who know what they're doing. And we do not have that in the realm of pedagogy. And pedagogy actually competes because uh, people, schools. So when I was recruiting the 50 schools for our research study last year, I met with curriculum directors from around the nation, all 50 states, all areas. And I sat in Zooms, I sat in live meetings, and I talked to them about pedagogy. And what I heard over and over and over again is, we love this, but we're taking on a knowledge building curriculum. And so we don't have time to think about the pedagogy piece. And I actually saw districts that had taken on pedagogy, had to put it aside so that they could focus on the F word, on the fidelity with the new knowledge curriculum. And I saw their data go down. And this is what alarmed me about that whole movement was that it was crowding out, even though everybody says, oh, we're going to do both. We know the reality. Judy, what is the reality? When you take on one of these big boxes, do you still have- Teachers are overwhelmed as hell. And there's a learning curve. And, you know, it's not like, oof, you snap your fingers and you get magical data. It still comes back to thinking about that pedagogy. If you don't think about that pedagogy and what you're doing and how you're teaching and what you're showing and modeling to those kids and understanding the gradual release, I do it. We do it together. We might need to do it together again. And now I'm releasing responsibility to you. Looking at that task, was the child able to accomplish it? And if they weren't going back to the drawing table, that's not going to be written in any of those programs, I don't think. Yeah. What do you say, Faith? So, no. And I think that programs come and go. We've seen this. Um, Jen, you mentioned reading first. And I don't know if you know, I was a regional coach. And so... I, I saw firsthand the work that we were doing as coaches, but I can't disagree with you as far as what you were saying, as far as um, some programs in, some programs out, and the conflict of interest that went along with that. I wasn't a part of any of that. All I did was, you know, model lessons and go into schools and help teachers, which is my happy place. But, uh, <laughs> but, Jen, let's switch to this conflict of interest. I really want to discuss this a bit. So um, what I think Leslie brought up before was that, you know, there are marketers out there that we don't realize they're marketers, um, but yet they certainly are 
marketing, whether it's for a particular program or a certain idea that's being pushed and steering people in a certain direction, how can the public really know um, what's going on? And as Judy said, a sheep in wolves clothing, right? Um, so, I, well, I think the kind of the first piece of that is- It's I have it a wolf in yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I that. to read that out loud, Faith. I wrote I you know and I read just what you wrote and I'm like, I said yeah. that. I'm like, you're giving me backwards information, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think there are I don't think there's a lot of wolves of sheep's clothing. I think there are people who who are I mentioned trust before, and I think there are people who have formed very strong friendships, very strong relationships with publishers, with creators. And so they they want to advocate for them. They want to support them. They want to they want other schools to see what they see. Um, they believe very strongly in something. And so their their evidence is part of the trust they have for a creator. And so I think part of what we need to do, or kind of just in terms of how we talk about these things, is just really keep asking for transparency. If someone you someone you trust has recommended a program through, you know, if there's an advocacy group, ask to see behind the curtain, like Leslie was talking about the 990s and, and kind of see, and just ask for that transparency. It's uncomfortable to ask for, but that has to be part of the conversation. And I think, um, and if I could for a moment, just kind of go back. What is the 990 again? I, I forgot it. For, for um, nonprofits. It's you're able to look into all aspects of their spending and who contributes and it gives you a lot of information. Wow. So, and it, it's part of it is, it's just having a transparent conversation. And again, the it's the implication isn't that this current group of advocates are in any way empowered or that an accusation of any sort. It's we made the mistake before, let's not make it again. <laughs> but if I could, I do want to kind of just mention uh, what Leslie was saying about pedagogy and you were stressing the importance of it. And I brought up the word kind of the use of trust. And I want to go back to that one more time. Because one of the things that's happening is there are a group of pedagogical experts who are being sidelined, and that's the reading recovery coaches. And a lot of people are treating reading recovery. You know, I again, I'm not a I'm not a reading person. I don't know. You know, I was trained under. in reading recovery, right? I'm I'm a former reading recovery person. Uh, I I don't know if you're a changed your position or, but when I've had conversations about the discourse with reading recovery people, the first place they go is pedagogy. They talk about how they talk about the reading with students. They talk about the books that they use. They go right to the teaching. And I'm worried that there is a cadre of reading experts that are being sidelined because they're, they're reading recovery teachers. Well, I'm gonna stop you there for a second. Because sure. um, again, that's another topic but um, that's something else. But I do think one of the reasons that that that's out there is because it goes back to strategies and evidence in strategies and three queuing is has been debunked. So if reading recovery teachers were using that, it's not a knock against the teacher. It's a knock against the reading recovery. I, I want to make that clear that any problems that are talked about, it's not a personal attack on a teacher, but it is something that I think is important because kids' lives are at stake. Yeah. Right. But and I don't want to be, I don't want to go off on that right now. But I mean, I appreciate what you're trying to bring up as far as conflict of interest. Um you, you could, Tell me what where you're going with that. I just want to make that clear to others that there's a reason why that happened. And it was really about the lack of evidence for the approach, not against te reading recovery teachers. Yeah, so that, I, I, the reading recovery was a slightly different. Uh, you guys know my head is like, like really into this because that was my whole life. So I'm going to keep on listening, though. <laughs> so the conflict of interest is one kind of thing. I wanted to connect the reading recovery folks to the issue of pedagogy that we were talking about before. And so kind of two different sort of things there. But to go back to the issue of conflict of interest, I just think in terms of the conversations we're having around schools is that if anyone is advocating for a program, 
we should be feel empowered and comfortable to say, tell me more about how you learned about this program. Are you endorsing it formally? Um, you know, kind of asking those kinds of questions. And it's not disrespectful. It's not rude. It's a reasonable thing to ask, given the history of you know of the other the things that are going on. Um, and so Leslie, I, I apologize. I think I saw you wanting to say something, so I shall mute myself. No, I, I want to just um, tag team on something. Um, Jen, years ago, you and I disagreed about something around DEI. And I think we got on the phone, but I remember- Can you explain what DEI is? Oh, about diversity, that? equity, and inclusion. And Jen and I had the most civil conversation, even though we were disagreeing on Twitter and you were back end and we were DMing and we were on Twitter and I learned and grew from the exchange, but there were no hidden agendas. You know, we were there to learn and we were there to support each other. Um, what I worry about is hidden agendas. So Faith, I'm going to go right into the conflict of interest here, but with the example of knowledge building, we all love knowledge building. We all believe in it. When it first came out, I was like, whoa, this is amazing. It was back in 2012 when I was working with the whole state of Tennessee to roll out evidence-based practices for writing. And we were grounding everything in knowledge. And that was, Tennessee was ahead of the curve on that whole thing. And David Coleman and Sue Pimenthal were our gurus and still remain people very close to my heart right now in terms of their vision of grounding instruction and knowledge and science, social studies, all of that good stuff. But then it somehow took a turn and it became the thing rather than something that we leverage and use to build readers and thinkers and mental mo models and schemas that can transfer and the deeper work of building language and pedagogy. So all of that sort of took this strange turn and conflict of interest. When I began asking questions, I got absolutely maligned on Twitter. I And it was all ad hominem. And I'm sure that the day after you publish this, my Twitter feed is going to fill up with ad hominem. And I maybe I'll you just say one. About people that care and support you and know that you're doing a lot of <laughs> No, it's fine. But I'll, I'll have one response that I'll keep, you know, just ad hominem, question mark. Can we go back to the facts? Yeah. Um, because that's where the conflict of interest comes in. And what you both said that when your paycheck is tied to what you're doing on Twitter, it's very hard to engage in a civil professional way. And so, yeah, I'm asking questions about the curriculum insight project. I've been asking, um, I've been asking about knowledge and instead of getting reasonable responses, I'm getting ad hominem attacks. I'm getting all kinds of responses that are not just answering the question of where is the evidence for knowledge building? I can't find it. I know that there was a major study in the UK that showed that foregrounding knowledge itself, the building of facts, did not work. What James Kim did was something very different. And that kind of conversation could not be had. Now I'm asking who's funding the Curriculum Insight Project. I have spoken with the Reading League. I have asked these questions. They have answered me but I'm not able to get answers about curriculum insight. Um, Ed reports. I'm really glad to hear from Jen that that they do have a conflict of interest statement out. That is interesting to know. So why is everybody, Leslie, why is everybody, like when I go online, why is everybody saying you can't trust Ed reports? You can't trust Ed reports. Don't trust Ed reports. I, you know, it's fascinating. I, with the day they came out, I went ballistic and said, hello, where is, there's four pillars in it. I said, where's the fifth pillar for evidence? And there was an IES guide that I kept attaching to all the conversations and saying, aren't we going to be looking at evidence, some kind of evidence? But they were looking at how glossy the pictures were and how well they aligned to the standards, but there was no evidence pillar. So I was leading the charge and I was getting silenced and you know yelling into a cave. And now all of a sudden they must have done something. I mean, Judy, the only logical conclusion is that because they think HMH is okay, and that conflicts with the agenda of the two people who are out there who are really pushing the leading the brigade against Ed reports. I mean, really think about it, Judy. There are two people leading that brigade. Something must have happened. I think about people. I just try to think about movements. And I think that there's movements and clubs right now. And I'm definitely not part of any club. I'm an independent. Yeah. And I'm going it's to keep asking for answers. I also want to go back to what Jen said about reading recovery. 
I think that you know, I, I can't stay silent on it. I want to give a shout out to so many reading recovery people that have been messaging me. Um, when I was part of that community, there were really open-minded people that were lifelong learners. And there's many people making those shifts, especially with the decoding piece and the kind of books that they use in the classroom and not using the queuing system. Kudos to you guys. But also, there were many things that were evidence-aligned, and they're a big part of who I am still today in, in, the, in the way I teach writing, in the way that I use Oconan boxes, in the way that I work with kids with phrasing and fluency. So who but, knows? So but can I just things. stop you a second? Yeah, you can. Again, I think we're going off on a tangent because um, this is not about reading recovery now. I, I mean- I mentioned it. I know she mentioned it, but she mentioned it about conflict of interest. And I think- I mentioned it about pedagogy. I mentioned it about pedagogy. Exactly, exactly. And when it comes to pedagogy, that's why I'm so tied to pedagogy. That was instilled in my bones. And, and, I, be and I believe, and I do believe that is where we all are at right now. We all believe that we have to build teacher knowledge and school district uh, knowledge about how to choose a curriculum that they are part of. And the program is not the curriculum. The program is the tool. The curriculum is what needs to be taught. All those important pieces. But I think people are having trouble. But, but they're being tied to a program and people are being forced to pick something that is not what it's meant to do. It's just a tool. So, But I don't think students really are prepared to deal with the they're not prepared. That, that's the point. They're not prepared at all. I'm not prepared yet. But isn't it isn't it funny that the critique of Ed reports is not so much where is the evidence? I I I'm I can't bring up right now what the critique of Ed reports should be, but the the critique should be where is the evidence? And I get it that test scores may not be the end all be all, but we need some way to measure the effectiveness of a curriculum. And where are the calls for measuring? Instead, there's just calls, adopt this, adopt this quickly. It's got good knowledge or whatever. I got to give Leslie a cheers. <laughs> Go ahead. You want me to do it? And if if we don't get there, Judy, okay. just to try and say something helpful, then let's just go back to what we do know works. We know explicit, systematic. We know that cutting the noise, the AIMS symposium today was amazing about decluttering and just doing what works and shaving down and getting to figuring out what in whatever we have does work and yeah. using that rather than getting caught up in this market increase. I, and I think that's that's part of the issue. Jen, um, you were saying that you wanted to talk about um, pedagogy. And I saw you smiling before when some comments were being made about, um, you know, different aspects of uh, what Leslie was talking about with conflict of interest. Could you elaborate on what you were saying? Well, sure. The Kind of the point I just wanted to kind of what was making me smile is that a lot of this is just interpersonal dynamics. We have in-groups and we have out-groups and we have people we trust and we have people we distrust. And I know we want to move systems and we know we want to get, we want to make sure every child leaves school able to read. But we, I, I always kind of go back to that parent, the idea that when someone changes their mind, we can either say, well, you know, it took you so long. Why didn't you do this four years ago? Or, you know, I told you this six times. Why didn't you, you know, why are you agreeing now? Why didn't you agree on the fourth time? Or we can say, I am so glad you're here now. Can we talk about this? I'm here for any questions that you have. I agree with that. You know, yeah. anything along. And I, so I think part of that, a lot of the Twitter dynamics are because we're not talking. We can't see. We don't, we don't get a lot of the media. We're, you know, reaching conclusions. And so I think in terms of the discourse, in terms of the rhetoric around all of this, um, you know, having conversations offline and having those conversations away, keeping things smaller, you know, closer, more local, letting people talk with people they trust and kind of celebrating small moves in whatever form they may take. Mm -hmm. And you know, asking people who are doing formal recommendations just to be more transparent in what's going on behind their recommendations. 
I really love that, Jen. And I think I'm going to try this on Twitter and say, hey, let's Zoom. Let's jump on a Zoom for 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jen, you get a cheers. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what about the BS button? I think that we haven't used that at all. So, (laughs) and well, let's talk about that. Leslie, what do you think from your article and, you know, your view of what's going on, where's the biggest BS flying? What's what's the problem here in terms of just say it and you know without names, but what you know, what are we talking about? I I see the BS flying. I know that there's a lot of BS going on. Um I, I'd like to hear your opinion. I think we need data. I think we need evidence. I'd like to see evidence of um, the approach that I work with, self-regulated strategy development foregrounds, SEL, that's been lost in the conversation. I'd like to see growth in kids' um, joy in their social emotional learning, in absolutely loving writing, feeling like it's their favorite time of the day or whatever they're learning. I want to see that piece. I want to see the scores going up. Um, A big BS I'm seeing is that I see data come up, but it's skewed. And I'd like to see some kind of person. Why? Why is it? Let me because you see people student. you see people putting up how they moved in the rankings but not in the ELA but then you find out that their rankings were a mixture of math and literacy and they're talking about literacy when they put them up oh that and, gets a big bs right yeah here. or you see lucy Hawkins put up grade 3 moved or some company had put up grade 3 moved well you worked with the whole school where are the other grades So we need some kind of independent, you can't have people just throwing out data and then getting 20 likes. Hey, that's great. Look, the data went up. And then you look at it, you're like, but wait, that's grade three. You were in the whole school. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to, or, or, you know, we heard of one school out of 500 that made some nice gains with this. Well, where are all the others and who is tracking all this? Mm. Jen, what do you say about BS? What are you seeing? That's a big BS issue even Um, though reading is not your thing but just terms of bs uh, on. i will absolutely play the fifth but i will say um to put a a a plug out for my profession not me personally i think a lot more report writers need to hire copy editors and a lot more report writers need to hire um, developmental editors and fact checkers uh, research checkers i think there's a lot of people who um, are very very good at google and are very, very good at finding sources, but haven't yet developed the skills of research. Um, And sometimes they're putting out reports where they're making claims that don't quite match up with their arguments. Mm -hmm. And so I would advocate that if anyone is feeling as if they're maybe offering a little bit of BS, um, the Editorial Freelance Association has a directory. You can find copy editors. Um, you can find all sorts of researchers to help you. Just double check your work before mm-hmm. you put it out to the general public. Judy, BS flying. What do you think? Um, with Jen, I think, you know, I didn't really know a lot about fact checkers until I have one at home. I think it's definitely something that, you know, especially journalists are writing a lot of articles. And um, I wondered, Emily Hanford must have used fact checkers, no? How do I know? How do we know who's using fact checkers and who's not? Reliability of the source. For example, different news outlets have different levels of credibility and you can Google them. APM is considered. You can just just put in APM level of credibility, Forbes level of credibility. They're very different. But you know what it is? You know, teachers are just trying to get through the day and we're just hoping that the information that's shared with us, we want to make sure we drink a cup of coffee or get out kids to school or can write a lesson plan. It's just very overwhelming for all of us. And I hope that, you know, we just come up with solutions. I don't, you know, I think this whole dynamic on Twitter. It's like a Twitter storm. And I just want the storm to go away. It's not going away, honey. It has to go away. You go off, but it's not going away. It has to go away because you know what? You could feel when people are out there for the kids. And I don't think that everybody's out there for the kids. Find the Facebook groups. 
I just went into UFly. It's beautiful. I've gone into, I don't want to mention names, but I've gone into different Facebook groups of um, teachers who are using evidence aligned or evidence based practices. And they're posting what they're doing in their classrooms, and other people are getting ideas. And it's really uplifting, and the camaraderie and the community, it's really beautiful. Can I ask you something else, guys? So these programs, right, as expeditionary learning, it's not new. Right. Why don't we have any evidence? Like people are saying, some people are saying there is evidence. I don't understand. Like we've known about the science of reading for a very long time. Some of these programs aren't new. Why don't we have bodies of evidence, like real evidence? Why? Comes like back why? to that grid that I want to make with the name of the school, the context, the contextual factors, and then the ELA growth outcomes. I'd like to have that. But why chart. are we still talking about this? for so many years, you know? Why? Judy, you're asking a million dollar question about how public education in America works. We do, I, we're, <laughs> we're getting late to the end of our podcast here. I'll have to tackle that another time. <laughs> I, I don't, I think, um, honestly, I think Judy asked a good question though, that um, if certain programs have been around a while, shouldn't we have something more than what we have. And yet we really have very little evidence. Judy mentioned um, that article that came out recently with um, Jill Barclay, I think, um, is the journalist. Um, you know, one of her first paragraphs was, we really don't have a lot of evidence on knowledge building curricula, right? So, and but yet it's being pushed as if we do have a lot. It's promising. That's how she left the article. It's promising. The same as when Natalie Wexler said, well, you know, we have to give it time. But right at this moment, we don't have a lot of evidence. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Here's my BS. Okay. This is my BS. Uh oh, Faith, you're wild tonight. You're no, wild. no, this, <laughs> this, this really just gets me. I don't understand how we have nonprofit organizations getting money, supporting the nonprofit with for-profit companies and those for-profit companies have something to gain by contributing to the nonprofit company. So right there is a conflict of interest and that is what's happening. I And I encourage people to look into this. I am not going to name the nonprofit and I'm not going to name the for-profits. All I will say is that if you look at Certain nonprofits out there, they are getting donations, money, funding from the for-profit publishing companies. And then they're doing their work. And, and they're then, going out and pushing only those four and denigrating the ones that are not on that list. Bingo. So bingo. how is that a nonprofit? Yikes. That looks like that, a profit to me. That is a problem. Point. We need good marketers. And these people are passionate. And you have to, like a worthy adversary, like you have to admire them. They love kids. They love what they're doing. They're amazing people who care about kids and believe in what they're doing. But it's for profit. It's a profit market. If the, if the companies are paying you to go and sell their product, even if you love their product, that's not a nonprofit anymore. Now you're a profit. You're working for a profit company. So that's where I'm lost. Me, and there are it's not necessarily a bad thing. And if there are groups that are doing that, the issue but it should is be for profit. Just communicate that. Just say that this nonprofit organization has been underwritten by this publisher. Here's our relationship with the publisher. Here's how this relationship works. Here are the things we will do. Here are the things we will not do. So if that's if you know faith, the relationship you're describing, it doesn't necessarily have to be a deal breaker as long as the non-for-profit is very, very transparent about okay. what they're doing and why they're doing it. Leslie, would you say there's great transparency in what's going on? I haven't found it because I have asked on Twitter. I've been told that my communication style should be different, but I don't know how to ask who funds you in another way than saying who funds you. 
Um, so I'm not sure if that's a communication issue or if that's somebody who doesn't want to be transparent and is annoyed that they're being asked to be transparent. Yeah. And Judy doesn't stop there. There are nonprofits that donate to schools and then they get book deals and then they make a lot of private money off of those book deals more than they donated. Um, and there's all kinds of things happening that just need to be, as Jennifer said, transparent. Yeah. Can we have a happily ever after? <laughs> I think we do, Judy, because we're in we're in a very special moment in that SOR is getting so much attention, all the legislation that's happening. But I think that you and Faith have to be superheroes and have to make sure that this very special moment does go someplace really wonderful where we win and we focus on pedagogy um, instead of letting it go south like it has before where conflicts of interest end up dampening our very special moment. We're in an incredible time and the possibilities are just so open and so broad and I've never been more hopeful. Oh, good. Well, I guess the ending would be that no teacher quits because of how SOR advocates treated her. That no teacher feels as if she's not a good teacher because of the messages she's getting related to reading instruction. That every teacher feels that if they're gonna make a shift in their practice, it's growth, it's a shift, it's not an admission of failure, it's, they're not bad, they're still a good teacher. And I do not want a single teacher to leave the profession because of this movement. That's a very good point. That that's, is an excellent that, point. That's an excellent point. Yeah. But um, getting back to, and we'll wrap up, but just, um, Leslie, one thing that you had said about this um, being a very promising time, I'm optimistic, but this issue with what I'm seeing with, um, you know, these, these programs that are being pushed, I see history repeating itself. I predict that if it goes down this path in five years, and I put this on Twitter, people are going to be saying, see, SOR is a bunch of BS. And that's what's going to happen because if we keep making these same mistakes again and again, it doesn't matter what's in the box or what's being pushed. It's the pattern. I'm seeing a pattern again, repeating itself. And that's to me, um, you know, a problem. So any last thoughts from any of you that we didn't cover anything else that you want to say? Judy, I, I mean, Faith, I just want to say it could be you that is helping to save this because you're shining <laughs> such a bright light on it. Judy and Faith and Faith, because the two of you are shining such a bright light on it. Um, Judy, do you feel like you're better equipped to teach children to read now? A thousand percent, and I could actually. Well, then there's credit. your hope. I can give credit to the. You New York made a State shift. Department of education, you know, I got trained in reading recovery. Then the then things shifted into structured literacy, and I have learned so much in my journey in the last seven years. I mean, I feel great. And isn't that your hope that more people will do? And with Abby's, you know, goodwill and 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 world peace kind of attitude here of of let's bring people together and let's not make teachers feel bad let's not make judy feel bad about what she did you meant jen. did you mean jen not abby and jen oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, judy. That, no that that jen is here saying you know we need to bring in the teachers and call them in and bring them along I, just yeah just like i agree with that. leslie i'm with leslie i think just you know teachers just need to understand what are we doing why are we doing it and how is it going to help children? Mm -hmm. And how's it going to and make sure that our tax dollars are going toward the PD that changed your world and not toward a big expensive box that's going to that's make actually a really good point. Rich, uh -huh. we have that's to really be careful with those tax dollars. There are tax dollars, and that they should go toward love and transformation. And and but how can the average person each know, other along? Leslie, that that sounds all great, but how can the average person? It's going to be person to person, just like Jen. What did you do? Said. Hey, Department of Education, <laughs> please give 
no, a it's going to be teacher to teacher, getting together at PD events, mentoring each other and, and teaching each other. It's not going to be a big box that arrives. Maybe the big box That's is school sure. and there's a place for it, but it's really going to be teacher to teacher. And Go we Leslie. have evidence for coaching. I mean, the evidence there is practice. evidence for coaching. There sure is. So, um, all right, Jen, any last thoughts? Uh, my cat, I do the evening feed and my cats are about to get little knives and come stab me to death. So <laughs> okay, I'm you're ready to dress up and <laughs> so are we. All right, well, thank you for getting together. Thank you, Leslie, for writing such a powerful article. We will attach the article in the show notes. And um, I really thank both of you for joining us and having an honest conversation. Judy, any last words you want to say or you want to just visit our website, theliteracyview.com. You could subscribe to our YouTube channel. Everything is on there. You can also now write messages to us. Um, we're getting lots of messages and, it's, you know, share the work that we're doing. Share it on, on your feed, share it on other feeds. That's the best way that we could all make a difference, one view at a time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks for the invite. Good, good night. night.